Всем привет, это проект Альфа. Hello, everybody. This is Project Alpha. My name is Nikolai Feldman, and you're watching War Diary with Alexei Rostovich. Alexei is joining us live. Good evening. Hello. I suggest Alexei we start with review of the front. We have skipped on that for the couple last streams. It seems like the front is somewhat frozen, perhaps because we're not uh, discussing it, and it may be a false feeling. So perhaps let's talk about what was changing during that time. All right. Well, first of all, it indeed has frozen a little bit in the sense that it stopped being as active as it did uh, two three weeks before that russians continue trying to make some motions in the Kharkov direction the great battle of lovchansk etc but here i do share the opinion of konstantin mashevets who thinks that this whole operation was designed not only for psychological effort but also as a military attempt it has a military value because this uh, push near Lvovchansk is an attempt essentially to get to the back of our Kupinsk group to bring it on their attention to make sure they need to reinforce their northern flank and that was probably the initial ideation to affect this part of the front but as you can see they are not successful they are suffering significant losses both sides, ours and the Russians, are reporting that nobody has success, but also looking at the lack of actual movement, and that would also be commented upon by Russia, if it existed, there is no actual motion, any success there. If you hear our sources, they tell that we are destroying them, and despite all those five scary arrows drawn on the deep state map, uh, these uh, troops are not really moving forward. Now, let's look at Kupiansk. They're trying to push and find new spots where to get through our defense. And to translate deep state to arrows to the human language, it implies uh, them having tactical actions, tactical front actions, without any significant change in the front. So a group of five or 25 comes over, gets destroyed. The next group of 25 comes over next day. Near Baravaya, they're also trying to exert some motion on our front, but without any significant success. They had small successes in capturing positions of uh, platoons and uh, the same thing, our successes were about of the same caliber, capturing their smaller positions. Near Liman, Russians were declaring Belogorovka to be taken, but too early. Our troops have been standing there since first part of this war, they're still there and uh, successfully defending that area. Let's continue going down. All right, here we can take closer. Here you can see that Chasovyar and Bakhmut area. They're trying to encircle Chasovyar from the north. Not quite working for them yet. And they're solving three tasks here. They want to go over the north, Bogdanovka, Kalinovka direction. They tried to push alongside the road. They were fighting for Ivanovska for quite a while and have gotten it. So they're trying to push further on the road. And also here near Klesheevka and Andreevka, they're trying to cross the railroad and push us further. To the north of Andreevka, they actually succeeded a little bit. Andreevka were still holding. This is where they have some opportunity if they continue to develop their success here. If they succeed in dissecting our ledge here, and pushing deeper onto Andreevka and cutting through Klesheevka in the middle. That will be a bad story for us. In terms of defense, they might liquidate this uh, ledge and then Taretsk and Chasavyar will feel a lot more pressure. And they might get some success in that direction. As for further down south, after a small pause, they took Novoalexandrovka here, according to recent news. Our side might not be in agreement with that, but one needs to understand that disagreement over that uh, implies that we perhaps are still holding one or two houses, and then technically that village has not been taken. Here, the road pakrovsk konstantinovka is a key road. It's a bit to the north, and if they figure a way to get there and to cut this road, they will get a significant success in disrupting supplies coming to the northern part of the front. And if you go a little south to right near Acheretina, yep, over here, 
they're trying to eliminate such a ledge that we still have. And you can see that they're trying to straighten it out here. You can see that Novoselovka, then Evgenievka, and they're trying to make a small circle here too. Jump further to Kamashovka, over where the mouse is. So they're not pausing here, they're continuing to push further. So their desire to push further to the west is still continuing and logically they should have been pushing to the north to cut more roads and disrupt the front in the north. They should have nominally concentrated their effort on cutting pokrovsk konstantinovka road, but uh, this is another strategy to push deeper to the west further, to tie our troops more on this side and make it more difficult for us to resist in the north. All right, let's go further south. Kurahovka and Kurahova. Their continuous desire to cut Kurahova Vugledar protrusion, that uh, southern ledge that we have, and they're trying to do it in two ways. One is over here towards north, another in the south, and they're not really successful. Now let's go to the Zaporozhye front. The activity there is not high, but how we know from Mariana Bezugla, we have recently lost Rabotina, whatever his uh, military sources are saying. Technically, the settlement is still there. The protrusion is still somewhat covers it, but we are losing the advantages that we've gained during the last summer counteroffensive of Ukraine. And neither of the side can actually be too successful here because both of us exert most of our resources in the north. And about Krynki, Mariana also commented that uh, that position has been lost and the command of our Marines are still reporting that they're holding some perch there. Um, that is implying that we still have some land, but we don't. We just conduct some operations on this island shore area, but we're technically not holding Krynki anymore. You can see it in red, it has been captured. So the long experiment about acquisition of a small base on the left bank is over. We don't know the results of it because we don't know the data from both sides, but at least we have one positive result because we have been holding it for quite a while. We've been holding a serious Russian group. And this is a strategic point. It's only about 80 kilometers to the mouth of Crimea Peninsula. And Russia is holding a significant amount of troops here, up to two paratroopers division, rather battle-worthy, and they're concerned with our possible development of success here. We don't know the exact costs, how much did it cost both sides to hold it, to take it back. The Russian side is complaining that they've been destroyed significantly and they have lost a lot of troops. And we also have some skeptical voices that are saying that uh, it did cost us quite a bit and we shouldn't. So military historians will be probably judging that situation later after the war. After the loss of Krynki, Alexei, do you think the group that is not really tied with other tasks, can they move them partially to the other flank? Very small group, I think. They th I think they'll move maybe a little bit out, but since Krynki have happened already, there might be another scenario here, and they would probably want to hold troops here to make sure that they can defend their shore, because uh, I suspect we will continue scaring them will continue exerting enough pressure and we have created a perspective a potentiality of a significant threat on this flank so they would be holding some of the troops on this side as well in your opinion that slowdown that happened on the front what is it due to there is some movement right near chesavir and other places but we are not seeing a mass advancement that was promised by russian side why is it not happening they don't have enough forces, they don't have reserves. Whatever they had, they dropped near Kharkov, and we moved some of the reserves that we had, and both reserves are entangled. They are tied up there. In order to continue moving someplace else, they need more reserves somewhere, and they at best have 60,000 troops that are not engaged in action. So they're barely recovering their losses. Those 30,000 that they're saying they get monthly in their drafting commissions, they are barely enough to refill their losses. And they're failing to create a new army, a new corps, or additional force that would change the situation on the front. 
uh, most significant comment here is that they are running out of equipment, their speed of getting new armor, new rifles, and new supplies is rather slow. So even if they gathered more people, they do not have anything to arm them with. And now they're talking about maybe midsummer and more sober heads are saying perhaps autumn when they would be able to actually conduct their counteroffensive or offensive, however you take it. So, Alexei, what's their monthly need in the amount of people? How much they need monthly to refit their losses, to plug the holes? I remember last month our armed forces reported that we set some sort of record. We destroyed 30,000 dead or wounded. Yeah, roughly that's about the number. We zero out about a 30k out of their troops, both sanitary, dead and wounded. And obviously sanitary losses will come back eventually. So sanitary losses are the ones that include their troops leaving their location for a day or more. It could be lightly wounded, who would be back in a couple of days, it could be heavily wounded, who would never come back. But initially it is counted as sanitary loss. So that's about 30,000 that they're losing, and they're barely covering that. They compensate it with these newcomers, but they really don't have additional reserve. And 50,000 that they accumulated over time, this is a vanishingly minimal reserve. This is a reserve for maybe two small regional centers operations. And the front is huge. Now they added also Kharkov area. And as uh, Mashavets is writing, that puny reef supply refitting of 30,000 to the front, that's about nothing. With these moods and these numbers of soldiers, they would never be able to conduct a proper offensive operation. That's why the front is frozen. Why is it frozen on our side? Because we're still lacking Western arms and we do not have enough troops as well. Although our Congressman Kastenka did mention that this month we have drafted more than overall since the beginning of this year. And unwillingly, perhaps, he indicated the criminality of prolonged debate over this bill. There was also a statement by Congressman Garbenka that the need for our current mobilization is 110,000 people, and that stirred a bunch of recalculations, no arithmetic, that if we would need 110,000 per year. That implies at least uh, 500 people from each district that we currently hold. So in this light, it becomes rather unclear what else is available besides uh, the drafting commission sending their patrols to pick people up from the streets. Mariana Bezuglo made a rather good publication talking about the deficiencies of the drafting commission and how these results are being processed later on the whole vertical of the armed forces, mostly uh, land-based armed forces, our army. And in essence, this uh, the way she implies is that these patrols pick enough resources that then are being sold to different parts of the army vertical. And the question that she poses, why is it so commercialized? Why all these monies are going in the gray area? Why people are buying off their chance to not be drafted? Right, so what she brought up to light is that in the armed forces of Ukraine, we also have corruption. And it implies that drafting commission actually is involved in drafting different troops to different places, different uh, military branches. So it's not just army, it's also some of the territorial defense and some other branches, except for police perhaps. So she did highlight that uh, our government, our state, succeeded in creating another grey schema that is essentially a huge vacuum cleaner to pump out cash from our population. This is a very serious acquisition, and in a normal country, a normal Western country, that would produce an effect of a bomb, but in our society they just swatted it off, saying, well, whatever. In Britain, I think, you would see already 12 different parliament commissions that would be a political crisis and the government would be resigning. If you're being thrown a public accusation of that, not somebody, but by the deputy head of the Security Council in the Congress. But Ukraine is a fantastic country where you can get accusations of different caliber and do nothing about them. And that's fine, whatever. Yeah, they're the congressman from the party in power actually, is bringing to light a big corruption vertical connected to the key element of our problem right now. 
about mobilization, but why, right? Why deal with that? Let's just label it that this is a psyop of Russians and don't care. This is what army immediately accused her back in, and different bloggers, uh, near military bloggers, they also accused her. And here we have, once again, a global picture, a congressman coming out and saying, army, you have created a big corruption scheme that on one hand mobilizes people rather ineffectively, and on the other hand, it also milks our citizens for money. So it's a system of chasing people to acquire monetary resources from them on the pretense of raising troops to fight the serious enemy. What does army respond? Uh, you're an idiot yourself, you're just attacking our generals. Both sides talked and left the stage. And nothing. And our society and our allies and probably even our enemies are just puzzled looking at this, what will be the outcome of it, right? But if you look with more details at what she's highlighting here, she's indicating the whole chain. Mariana is a rather knowledgeable person, and she did make a deep dive into that system, so she understands. Uh, I have some military officers highlighting to me different parts of her speech, of her uh, publication, saying that uh, it's curious who's writing these texts for her. I know she's rather smart herself, she's probably doing it herself. So, where does the drafting commission end up reporting to? This is the head command of the army, of the ground forces. And uh, this is the central point for drafting for all the ground forces, 70 plus percent of them, and territorial defense. All these commissions, all these elements of this pyramid, dead end in the central ground forces command. Our commander-in-chief is a graduate from this group, and all of his deputies and heads are red epaulets, so his group. And basically, me personally is also the red epaulette group member. I would say, yes, this is true, this is how it evolves there, and nobody controls it. Everywhere they have their own people. If the people are not from your group, they're getting pushed out. And decisions, a lot of them contradictory, are being taken without being rechecked. And I have a question to Mariana. Did you also raise this matter with the investigative committee, with the State Bureau of Investigations, or did you just publish it in the social media? Real question. Seriously interested. Right, in the public field. So she's saying that this structure leads to the fact that out of 10 people that are being brought to the drafting commission, one gets a call from the regional drafting commission, another from a regional command, another two get uh, waivers from a regional command of the army for that district. She's uh, calling out this organization as useless. She's accusing them of uh, being a relic structure that uh, allows employment of colonels and some generals. And out of the remaining few, two turn out to have reservations from being drafted, and uh, one more perhaps manages to buy his uh, freedom off with money. And then they have one or two volunteers, or one or two those who failed to wiggle away out of that. Right, and that's what she's writing. I actually have an acquaintance who was uh, visiting the drafting commission. They initially wanted $5,000 from him and finally agreed to 5,000 forgiveness. He was sincerely happy about it and saying that something started changing the country. And that was the third time he was uh, almost drafted. And it's a friend of a friend, so not my personal. Right, you understand this is a vacuum system that they tried to fight with, even under Zaluzhny, when Zelensky said, uh, change those people to army officers, and apparently we already swapped them back to those previous specialists who has uh, not seen, who have not seen the front, even in the computer game, so that system is again, is a big corruption vacuum cleaner that just sucks money out of our society. And it's very simple here, as I said before. Our main exam is ability to conduct mobilization in these times, this wave and perhaps the next one. If it is a key matter, the best forces of our country needs to be working with that. I think Ukrainians, as Gustav Vodich wrote back in the day, were the country of dreaming angels. I'm looking at what's happening in our armed forces and I'm trying to understand how, what experience can we get from it. How do we manage to get negative experience? Because if you take a bunny, 
put it on a bicycle and don't let it get off the bicycle for two years. It will at least learn to drive it. And in two and a half years, he probably will learn how to smoke and play music while riding a bicycle. But because two and a half years, that's significant amount of time for anybody to learn something. And what do we have here? What good examples do we have historically? Let's take Red Army. What two bright examples do we have there? Second World War and Afghanistan. Then there is an event happening that nobody needs knows how to deal with. And generals usually prepare for the last war, as they say, everybody does, right? Everybody, it's a huge war, Red Army, whatever it knew is not so. Everything is crumbling, a catastrophe, five and a half million get encircled and uh, imprisoned during the first year by the enemy. And yet, after each unsuccessful operation, Soviet system tried to change something. And they tried to change uh, things in small, things at large, from the way the fronts interact with each other, from the way the different types of forces interact with each other. Air Force, Army, Navy, changing generals, additional training, different kinds, from moral preparation to technical training. And by 1943, 1944, they managed to learn on a lot of blood, on millions of dead, yes, but Red Army of 1941 versus Red Army versus 1944, this is drastic difference. Soviet Army in uh, Afghanistan, whatever entered Afghanistan in 1979 or the 80s, one could cry over that. There were a lot of officers with pot bellies, uh, 50s plus, who were drafted from Turkmenistan and some other places. And Afghanistan specifics was counter-partisan fight. Soviet army never learned how to do that until that moment, never really on that scale. And then six years later, in 86, they almost destroyed Mujahideen completely and the Americans had to provide a lot of aid to somehow slow it down. So that Soviet army also learned. But what's up with the Ukrainian army? I keep asking myself, our glorious armed forces just refuse to learn? Nothing is happening? I'm observing and trying to see over the span of two and a half years of struggle with the eternal enemy that will either we will either prevail over or will die fighting. What changes did our armed forces go through? Any fundamental organizational changes? How about aggregating experience? The army is grinding itself by going over in the inertia mode, without attempts to change much. Four major questions – draft, train, use and return. Four major pillars of armed forces. I'm not even talking about nuance and engineering and military construction. And Mariana indicated a couple of those that, okay, we built the main directorate of unmanned aerial vehicles. It was Barana first and Sukharevsky. Sukharevsky is isolated because he is not from Sirsky's vertical. He is being isolated to the degree that he is not even invited to the meetings. Now then, they also created UAV forces as a separate group. But uh, it's been over a month and they're still failing to evolve in that direction to sign the needed documents. And those guys who are using drones are failing to sign all the proper paperwork. Right, the, these are tr the troops using them on the front. Right, perhaps if we are about to include this new type of armaments, we need to expedite this process, just as an idea. Perhaps it'll be, as I'm seeing it, it likely will branch up to be a separate branch, and it will be one of the key branches of our military. And that post of the battalion commander the other day, who lost a soldier that had 3,000 reposts about issues with defense. It shows again the level of catastrophic situation with the lower level commanders. One of the commanders is writing, over a month I have two company commanders dead and wounded, five platoon commanders and a bunch of sergeants. What my command suggests to replenish that with? Perhaps send one sergeant to training right now, another one in September, and nobody's even talking about company commanders, where are they going to come from? And this is a key link. Our problem is that we're lacking cadre military. The key elements, company commander and platoon commander, 
We practically do not have any left. We've been decimating them, minimizing their training. Not even talking about the quality of training at this point. The quality level also decreased significantly. And those who are being promoted from soldiers and sergeants, they very often lack systemic knowledge. And they lack different fields of expertise in order to command people. Plus, they're also suffering from the most significant losses. They're always in touch on the front with the enemy. They also bear the most responsibility. In those cases, when five Russians were advancing and a hundred of ours retreated, leaving their neighbor's flank exposed, in the meantime, their neighbors have 30 people holding a battalion position and uh, would not budge. These are typical situations for our army. So one of the key directions that we need to beef up is training of the lower level commanders. Same as uh, Russian Soviet army did in the Second World War, when they had replacement detachments of a division level and higher. They had enough officers to staff those detachments. They were holding them to prepare them and to then throw them on the front. However you want to train them, on a second line, on a third line, but we need more of those officers of all different ranks. And there are not even an attempt to train them, to organize it. However, Russian Empire was criticized in their Russian-Japanese war in 1905. These training options existed. They were present. The most dumb army in the world, those who made biggest mistakes, the Arab armies that fought unsuccessfully Israel, they did make attempts to understand and draw conclusions and get better. The only known army to me, and I know history pretty well, the only army known to me that is not making conclusions from what's happening with it is Ukrainian armed forces, Ukrainian defense forces. Well, Alexei, you asked what transformations are happening in the army, and I remembered here that we have a post saved um, by Roman Kovalev, who is telling about new instructions inside the armed forces imply that battalion commander has to be basically personally out in the front, be there at the zero. Oh yes, this order was given by Sirsky. He ordered all the battalion commanders to be closer to the front, to be among their subordinates. On one hand, we got used to having commanders on the front. Problem is that in the modern front, modern methods of attack will leave nothing from the battalion outpost, battalion command outpost, if it is uh, anywhere reachable. And there are 20 people there working on the battalion communications and plans. And we're risking now to lose the most effective chain link in this war. Do you know that when Americans invaded Afghanistan, they, before that, consulted cadre veterans of the Soviet army, who had experience from the Afghan war. And they were interviewing different ones, from general to the infantrymen. But their main effort lay within battalion commanders, because battalion is the first level of the army detachment where you can find different groups, different branches of military. Artillery, UAV, radio electronic interference, different kinds of infantry. And battalion commander is the last commander who still sees, observes the battlefield with his own eyes. But the amount of UAVs and the amount of targeting means present today will lead to destruction of battalion outpost, if it is visible, if it is found, if it is reachable. And if we're losing Battalion commanders, that'll mean the end to a lot of things. And I understand it may sound unfair. A mother of any soldier who perhaps has a high degree as an engineer is now fighting as a drafted infantryman, and now we have some battalion commander who maybe changes troops after troops and stays alive. How is that fair? And on the human side, it may seem unfair, right? Perhaps it is unfair to some degree. But if you want your country to stay one piece, and you do not want Russian troops to reach your city, battalion commanders need to stay alive and to continue commanding our troops. We, of course, have issues with battalion commanders. After the war, I said I will call out the results of checking their professionalism when we conducted that. Brigade commanders, battalion commanders, but they at least know how to do some things. Because if 
even at this level that they currently possess, they are destroyed, we will have a much worse picture. And our commander general could not figure anything better than throw battalion commanders closer to the front. I think in current conditions, battalion outpost will live maybe for a day. If they're super lucky, they may stay alive for two or three days. Because closer to the front, they'll easily find it with a triangulation, and then artillery and other missiles or whatever will take them out. Gliding bomb, Iskander missile, and there'll be ruins, there'll be nothing left. And this is a mad order. So look, we do not create a school of young commanding officers who would be able to organize defense and fight from planning to logistics, engineering and personnel management. And we're suffering from that. And there are battalion commanders, you, one should notice, that their battalion is standing at their same position that they were at at the beginning of war. And Russians still fail to push them. And there are also serious gaps in the front. And it all depends, a lot depends upon the commander. Only under good commander, the infantry person talent may be discovered and has some potential for fruition. And there could be initiative group formed and they could start progressing. And today, okay, our gold is of a low grade, understand. But now we're pushing them to the front line. This is the biggest diversion against our army. I think we do not have Russian spy ordering that, and I understand why they're doing it, because they're trying to put more work on the shoulders of those who actually knows, who know how to manage troops on the front, who can maneuver troops, who can figure something out. Problem is, when they get hit, there'll be nobody left. And once again, we don't have a school of young commanders, and we're about to flush down the commander of battalion group. This is madness. However much praise and hope and inspiration was expressed towards Ukrainian armed forces, in two and a half years the infant needs to produce more than just waving the rattler. You'd want him to walk, to perhaps talk. With all due respect and love to our armed forces, it needs to start producing some results. Another line for critique, and not even for critique, but for self-understanding, for knowledge of oneself, good Ukrainian word. It's a continuous fight for the lion. Where does that come from? From the top leadership. Top leadership who's failing to explain to civilians what are the effective results of our struggle. And instead they're pushing the line. And they're fighting to the last soldier to hold some position. We discussed before that in Ukrainian armed forces there are no combat orders, there are preliminary orders only. And this affects the outcome, because after the word combat order is pronounced, legal reliability dawns upon the soldiers and upon the commander. And commander cannot send soldiers to fight without providing enough means and measures for them to fight. You become legally responsible for your order and different responsibility than dawns on the troops as well. So when the commander orders to not let the enemy break through a certain position or orders to capture, the level of responsibility is automatically different. And then commander would not be able to boast at some drunk party that he wasted two or three rotations of his detachment. So they're giving preliminary orders. What is a preliminary order? Preliminary order is more nebulous. You get to this position and you try to do something. Be there and try to fight with enemy. That's roughly what they imply. I'm not even talking about terminology. Sometimes I'm reviewing some battle documents and I understand that military science in our army is uh, rather low, at a low point. For example, one of the orders would be to clean up the grove. What the fuck is that? There are only six actions known to the army. Defense, offense, march, positioning at the location, stabilizing actions connected to peacekeeping operations, and exiting the encirclement. There are no other actions that troops can do. Where have you seen the cleanup? What kind of a newspeak is that? 
And because of such a mess, and us failing to follow the basic regulations and demands of military code, and some rudimentary knowledge about the nuance of service is often presented as the knowledge of the military code, it doesn't really add much except for more fuel to the continuous conflict between mobilized and the cadre. Now, if cadre indeed knew the code and taught the recruits properly how to fight, what are the good practices from the very beginning, when military leadership would have enough balls and knowledge to actually come to the superior commander-in-chief and say, you know, move, moving of the front line by itself does not mean anything. What's important is being able to hold the front as a whole. We have probably suffered about a half of our losses fighting for some weird straightened lines and weird groves. We do somehow like holding the front by the line. While it would make much more sense to advance a little to take a better position or to retreat a bit and pick the better position. And that's where we are losing most people. This is the routine battle actions, unfortunately, for our army, when Russians came over, took the grove and wasted a certain number of people, then we come back and waste about the same amount of people taking it back. Where is the order to hold position? Where have you seen that the goal of defense is to hold position? The goal of defense is to disrupt the offensive campaign of your enemy. Ideally, you want to disrupt it to the entire length of their operations, but this is more complex work, a higher level. But at least to disrupt it, eliminate the life force, and then destroy military equipment, destroy armor, and only after that holding the objects and holding certain territories and newly added zones. This is tertiary goal. Same thing about offensive. Nowhere it is written that your goal, your primary goal, is to take enemy's positions. Fighting for enemy's positions is the most primitive formal sign. An army that is drowning in formalism because of the catastrophic ill-preparedness of the commanders of all ranks, lack of desire to fight with it, and lack of systemic effort on the high level, starts to fight for the positions and starts killing your husbands, sons, brothers, grandkids in that stupid formalism. That's why I understand Mariana. A lot of idiots are laughing at her, but she is the only deputy, a, a, an only congresswoman of her caliber who is trying to solve this problem, because our armed forces are falling to the lowest level of organization. We have some very high-tech branches of military, very good specialists who make do with what we have, who circumnavigate Russian air defense systems, who attack Russian airfields and Russian oil refineries, but this is not how you win. Ultimately, you win the war by the mass of infantry. They are the ones solving the war problems. Until the balls of the infantrymen are hanging over the target, regardless of how many F-16s have flown over this target and bombed it, you have not achieved the goal. And in the training, things are pretty bad. I get a lot of messages from training facilities. Some unnecessary torture and marching. Some guys who should not even be training. Some sergeants who have seen a glimpse of some military action are telling to the 50-year-old draftees that they don't understand anything. A curse word over a curse word, a lot of attack on a personality, and the person understands at the beginning. What do they get into? Where do we train our soldiers to be tactically smart, so that they would see the battlefield as they need to? Or is training of the basics, the lower level of battle command? You cannot do without it. You've seen how the proper training is carried out. We've done that. Right, I was filming it. Exactly. So this is a catastrophe starting with the training centers, catastrophe in how we draft people, catastrophe in how we train them, catastrophe in how we use them, and catastrophe in how we return back, how many people cannot get their prosthetics. These are huge problems. These are our brothers and sisters dying at the front. 
being grinded as meat, because the whole system is working at the lowest level. You know, if you drop a ball in a curved ball, it'll freeze at the lowest point, and in order for it to be higher, you need to continue exerting some activity, some pressure on it. Unfortunately, as a country, we're not doing that. Everything just flows by inertia. And sadly enough, the training cadre are pretty low in training themselves. And then very often the commanders on the front are also pretty low. Understandably, with lack of funding, lack of proper support, over the 30 years of disruption, we would not have the best officers in the army. Then we, of course, had some eight years of low-intensity war that educated a certain group of military officers. Now we had two and a half years of intensive fighting, which grinded many of them down to the bone. Many of them are dead or wounded and are not at the front anymore. Yet society still screams about our heroes. Meanwhile, we're wasting them in these groves. We need to do something about it. And it's basically an endless murder of our own people. Russians can afford that. Good luck with it. We can't. That's why I was ringing that bell, and I will continue ringing these bells, explaining and highlighting the deficiencies. We'll bring these examples that were leaked to the media, what Mariana was referring to. And I'm trying to use the already leaked information so I do not put people in precarious positions who communicate otherwise with me. So we can highlight that right now Ukrainian armed forces are performing subpar. They are an ineffective societal institute. They are not producing enough useful coefficient for the country. They're barely generating a lowest level to not fail the front, but overall, but that's because our enemies are dumb. If we had a smarter enemy, that would have been much worse. We were motivated to defend the country, but still, you know, with people leaving their detachments, that also reveals a lot of issues. So our country needs fundamental changes and rapid changes. And what is understood as change here when they are failing to create a new branch of military on the level of commanders, on the level of commander-in-chief, when the commander of this branch is being isolated from meetings. That's very low productivity. And when I hear all that, Nikolai, the hair on my legs rise up. What is the flank? I don't know. What is crossfire? No idea. What is reserve position? What is false position? Don't know. Alexei, you know what confuses me the most in this story? Hmm. One thing is when, as you use this term, wild growing commander who might not know some basics or some army codes, but when cadre generality do not know the realities of modern warfare, I'm reading Lutvak about the logic and strategy of war. He's writing about entering the epoch, us as a planet having entered the epoch of non-heroic warfare, where heroism is actually an indicator of issues on the front. And all these stories with holding positions and giving them symbolic meaning, it weakens the front. The necessity to hold some point generally weakens everything, the whole perimeter. And these are some basic fundamental things, as far as I understand, that should be understood at a higher level of command, right? Indeed, that highlights the lack of IQ, the lack of professionalism and the lack of balls within our generality to explain to politicians what is proper thing to do. Kutuzov, several hundred years ago, solved this problem for Russian Empire. In 1812, it's 200 plus years old, he solved an issue that if you save the army, you save the country. If you lose the army, you lose the country. Same thing for us. If we lose the army, there'll be no Ukraine. Doesn't matter what positions have we lost right now. 
destroy the enemy is a guarantee that you'll bring back your positions. Even if we will freeze the front at some point, preserved armed forces is the whole other level of negotiations, a whole other level of peace treaty, and a whole level of secondary attack or secondary war. And depleted economy is definitely a bait for an enemy to bind us with some poor conditions, poor peace treaties, and then come and attack us again. And Russians, they have that. They start wars stupidly, but eventually they graduate to a higher level. And if we do not catch up, we will suffer, we will suffer greatly. And if we cannot change ourselves during war, how can we change ourselves during peace? So Kovalev, commenting on the situation with battalion commanders, he said that uh, it's not from the good life that battalion commanders are being thrown to the front now. He highlights that the whole chain between the sergeant and battalion commander has been basically destroyed, so now they're using battalion commanders to operate troops on the front and risking the destruction of that chain. And even worse, Nikolai, we don't even have combat orders. We have preliminary orders. Well, combat orders is the backbone of all military action. Well, what can I say in this regard? Right now, battalion commanders, having gotten the orders from brigade commanders, are visiting their positions, trying to gather their troops so that they could give them some orders and try to refit the situation on the front. And the leadership is trying to solve the existing problem by pushing the battalion outpost, commanding outpost, closer to the front, so that they would be personally giving orders to soldiers in the trenches and demanding their execution from each soldier directly. Because people in charge at the positions are very often appointed to their roles only because there is nobody else to fulfill it. Unfortunately, they are incapable of giving proper orders or fulfilling the orders themselves. Nikolai, to understand what Ukrainian armed forces now, I'll try to give an example for our non-military viewers. What is an elder on the position? It's basically a sentencing to the army. There are no elders on positions. There are no positions. There is a position of platoon. There is a platoon strong point and a company strong point that is supposed to be occupied by some military detachment that has a commander. This detachment may withdraw to reserve positions, go for a maneuver, go for an offensive, take off and fly somewhere. It's not the position that is fighting, it's the detachment that is fighting. And the state of our detachments is a whole other matter. Very often it's a group, hodgepodge group of cooks, radio people, with some commander of the repair squad that was appointed to be a commander. And the whole system works very discombobulated because we cannot train them proper, we cannot apply them proper. This is a horrible state. Let's grab one of the rare specialties, air defense, and throw them to take back that grove. This is not an army, this is a military group that will have to yet become an army. By the way, today, speaking of the cooks on the front, there was an example in social Andrei Alokhin, I think, He's a writer and an actor. He was writing a post that his neighbor, Lucia, I'm saying the truth, I guess, that his neighbor was a volunteer and he volunteered to serve in Ukrainian armed forces. They did not want to draft him, but he insisted that he can go as a cook. So he's uh, wearing really thick glasses and according to that reporter, that actor, he indeed was a cook. Suddenly he was transferred to the front, to 110th Brigade, and that actor just got a message from him basically saying that I don't want to disappoint my mom, but tell her that I loved her and very likely I'm not coming back. And it was a today's post, very dramatic. I know it's causing some ripples. And I know this person, he's saying that his neighbor's eyeglasses indeed were thick, as thick as one's finger. And what to do in this situation, we don't know. Do nothing, I guess, Nikolai, right? Stand at the cemetery under the sounds of an orchestra. 
in order to do things right, we need to work on our recruitment system to make sure that we recruit people proper, that we use them proper, and that a person has a disability on vision, he should not be there at the front line. Even in the American army, they are, by the way, proud that out of 100 people, only 27 will see the enemy in some capacity. The rest will be working on the logistics and support, and they are not less important. We have a civilian country, very few people understand the basics of military service, despite us having fought this war for 10 years already. And we have, unfortunately, some fetish of a soldier. While we do not understand what it is, our society thinks that any manager can do that. It's a different story. And we also, as a society, do not understand how should I phrase it without any cuss words. that the labor of these 73 percent or 73 soldiers out of 100 who are not facing the enemy is just as important for victory as the labor of those who are running with the rifles in the bushes, or maybe even more important, because all the serious specialists who cause vast damage to the enemy, very often they do not even leave Kiev, or they leave for a trip and then come back or the specialists that run the long-range UAVs, just like Americans from Washington and other places are managing UAVs in Iraq and other places. Yes, they drink coffee and they fight at the computer screens. And one can be very upset that a lot of people are not in the trench, but they are actually causing more damage to the enemy very often between the coffee breaks. Remember that story about Obama? Where is their horse? So that societal background and horrible communication, which military have failed to establish in two and a half years of war, and both to the society and to the, our politicians, only a ton of hyper-narcissism and desire to stand in a posture of a hero forever, because a lot of people think that they got now their lucky moment, because they're fighting, they're part of the military, and they deserve a lot of respect in society. There are a lot of people like that on all chains of command, from infantryman to a general. They create a very distorted image of military and of modern warfare, how it is prepared, how it is planned, how it is organized, and how it is conducted. And then later we have soldiers writing, goodbye, mama, or dad, tell mom that I loved her, because me, repair materials person or logistics person or a cook is now being thrown to capture enemy position. And what would should uh, the family members write back? Sorry, Sonny, our Congress took half a year to push the bill through, and that's why we're throwing you to die in this operation. Sorry, son, I neglected military aspects of our society for 30 years, and that's why our generals are idiots. Sorry, son, that we've sold and destroyed a lot of our military equipment, and I understand you will die in 15 minutes, but this is our collective karma. Sorry. Sorry we cannot ask from politicians. Sorry we do not have proper parliamentary control over armed forces. Sorry, 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 that's what the dead should be writing to him. And at the end, Ed, also, we love you as well, goodbye because that would be the only honest answer. Well, Mariana Bezuglia, in her time, started an attack on Zaluzhny, by the way, that ended in his resignation, and now she's attacking the army, the army clan, so to say. Does it indicate that she finally figured out what the core root of the problem is and before she was just digging through? Well, Mariana is educating herself. She is present a lot in the army, she is making conclusions, she is communicating. And although I do not agree with some of her deductions, because you cannot cover army as a blanket, as one group, because there are different branches of army and there are different commanders. Some commanders only specialize to use their own troops, like infantry or artillery, and then there are other level of commanders who are trained to use different branches combined as an orchestra. So it is not only 
one level, it's different levels of training, and also it depends upon what clan is in power. If it is a dumb clan in power who doesn't know how to fight, something needs to be done with it. Problem, my question here would be, where do we take the new one? That's the average temperature in the room. The others are just the same. Alexei, there was also an idea that we should scale a good experience. We have 3rd Brigade and some other brigades that have some good elements of the body, right? That we can scale them up to division? Sure. A third should be deployed into a division and an army corps, but will anybody be decisive enough to do it? And third is not the only brigade, Alexei, right? That could be scaled up. You think it's true? No, they're not the only one. There are also other good brigades, good cutter brigades, but the question is, why, using the specialists of these brigades, do we not create these brigade schools by direction, right? Command south, command east, command north, find a way to create these schools, bring in sergeants and other officers who train well, who educate themselves, and use also good professionals who, perhaps after being wounded while they're recovering, who could train this personnel. It's way more important to train than to fight. In the best armies, the best experts are in training centers. The second best are fighting. Tertiary are the ones providing other things. We here have things very different. Everybody of the best wants to be on the front. And this is a problem. And these schools should be working. We should have established them as a system. I'm not even talking about switching to a division-army structure. And until we get new schools established that will be training their core at the front, I will continue ringing the bell on this topic and many others. But I can tell you one other thing. It would be good also to establish additional council with the Supreme Commander-in-Chief and a position of a personal military advisor who can stay with him in the cabinet and tell him personally how real things are in the front. And the council that allows to, while being not a part of a vertical, gather the information from the front, systematize it and present it. We have a lot of good commanders that we could use. Create the group of military experts with the central command who would be verifying all kinds of orders on different levels of command and would be reporting to the central command what's really happening, which commanders are making good decisions, which commanders are failing and we should push them aside or do not give them more responsibility so they would know their limit. Trust me, we got a lot of general colonels who would be able to provide that data, that input who could gauge it properly, who went through all the positions from the infantryman to the commander of the whole branch, Muzhanka and the like, who could evaluate, provide a very invaluable aid, train current generality, advise them where needed, and also provide additional level of control over current generality, because right now they are not feeling any control over them. Nobody's controlling our armed forces, because it's also a stigma on you if you start criticizing anything. But that's not how it works. You need more people from the same military with more experience to check them, who'd be able to highlight that general so-and-so is prone to losing more people than needed while achieving certain goals. We should be withdrawing him from the main reserve. And this lieutenant colonel is fantastic. Let's allow him to grow and allow him to grow in a higher position and maybe convert him to a general. Or maybe because if it's war, let's just elevate him. Where is that? Where is that group from 10 or 12 experts that would be advising these important, these important issues on different levels? On all commanders, all types of military action, all types of combat. I'm not even talking about the group that would be responsible for communicating with military industry, both government and private and a bunch of other sore spots that we have. But at least that. 
just that. End of part, part one.